You're listening to the Modern Healthcare Back Office, a podcast dedicated to solving the billing issues and gridlock facing the healthcare industry, presented by ProChant, hosted by Chuck Ellis and Rachel Schools. Hey there, folks. Chuck here, and welcome to the Modern Healthcare Back Office. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Ms. Rachel Schools. Rachel, how are you today? I'm amazing, Chuck. How are you? I am also amazing. I am super excited because today we are talking with Melissa Wagner, and she is ProChant's own VP of DME Services. Melissa, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Awesome. For those who don't know, I know you've made a name for yourself in the DME space, but for those who don't know, tell us a little bit about how you got into the DME back office side of things. Sure. So thank you for having me today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about the back office operation. I really ended up in the industry by accident prior to, to entry into the HME industry. I was working at a nuclear car plant. <laughs> So wow. that isn't an economy. I don't know what it is. <laughs> mm. But uh, certainly trying to find my niche as I was building my career. And fortunately for me, I was able to join in the early days a very successful, highly successful company up here in the New England region. And I can say I grew up in the industry with some great guidance and opportunity with a company that was growing. It was a region, high level, a well respected regional player up here in New England. And I uh, had an opportunity to grow into a leadership, senior leadership position, and specifically centered around RCM. We were well regarded uh, in our local region, our region up here, as the company that, that did things very well. I was fortunate to also be led, or the company was fortunate to be led by someone who was just a great leader and intuitively, you know, understood the business and provided the great uh, environment and growth to the business. So, so that's how I got into the business. From there, I was grew along, took a couple of different terms after some years there, went out and did some consulting and built, some time ago now, but built uh, a back office, basically BPO back in the day when there wasn't much, uh, there wasn't many choices in order to do that. So it was a little bit cutting edge at the, at the time, but it was being done a lot in physician, in the physician in, in the hospital, only other parts, much in DNA. So spent a number of years um, growing that business, and then after that, chose to um, look to the, the tech side and went to work for technology companies in the industry. And, and then, and so going back and forth a little bit uh, between the provider side, the provider being the, the direct care provider, and the uh, back office provider side. And I think that's provided a unique perspective when I've been in any one of those roles to say, I lived in everyone's world, right? As mm-hmm. I've been the cash poster. I've been the customer service person. I've been the leader of a company that was an outsource of those processes. And so I think that you think that brings some unique perspectives to understanding and being empathetic to uh, the position, the people on the ground, as well as the executives worrying about cash flow and, and the operations. Wow. That is an incredible list of bona fides there. So you might say a little bit about back office processes in healthcare, just a little bit. And and for those who don't know, BPO is business process outsourcing, correct? That is correct. All right. Awesome. Just want to make sure I knew. So let's dive in a little deeper here and let's start with kind of the state of the industry, because I think it's no secret that DME, not just DME, but healthcare in general when it comes to back office processes, is that a serious crossroads in the United States? I, would, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I would agree. The issues are not much different, uh, truthfully, than they have been over the years, right? They're, they may be in a different operational order than they were 10 years ago in terms of where the priorities are and where the focus needs to be to ensure that there are clean flames, first of all, before we can get to this very bad office, which is you know, the denials and so forth. But the issues are not much different. I think they're just positioned in a different place in the organization. There's much more responsibility on the front end process. So our front end teams has to not be just customer service and focused on coverage, but they have to understand a lot more about the back office process to keep things from flowing as much to the back office, i.e. denials. In the past, we could just let everything flow to the back office and you know, the billing teams, the collectors will pick it up a part of the day. And today, that's not true. I agree. I think that is what I see that has shifted the most in the industry is that we have started to embrace that 
there's zero distance between a problem and the source of a problem. And just like you said, Melissa, I see a huge focus going back to the front end to resolve problems before they start. Yeah. And that's been evolutionary. And I think most of the technology that's been, that has been developed in the past, say, five years, and as it continues to evolve, it is looking to that as a heavy emphasis and a focus. I think that because of that, there's, there's lots more opportunity for automation and technology because we need to continue the build capacity with an existing headphones to offset the continual and expected reimbursement cuts. But where I see the biggest, uh, where I see personally, still, it's a, a bit of a disconnect and a struggle with the external Hey, or connection of policy changes and hit pay for the last part, the reimbursement changes are easy, you know, change the speed schedule to this. But when you have a company that's dealing with whether it's national or regional, a multiplicity of payers, most of the Medicaid's now have cascaded down to a multiplicity of MCOs to process their claims, not all consistently following the, the parent guidelines of the Medicaid. And so I, in some of my most recent experience, there was a lot of continuous questions having to be asked amongst the teens. Does this one do 90 days? Can I, if I'm doing a drop ship resupply, do I have a few day leeway for this player that they allow me to ship four days early? Then the, I'm getting a little granular here, but I believe that some of the, where a lot is not different, where it's. A little more complex is at that front end when we're asking those front end teams to be all things reimbursement and customer service, managing those payer changes, who in the organization is notified, how do they get changed? And some of the technology and automation I don't feel has caught up with uh, managing those changes because usually through Prosper sends an email to the last email contact they had. For example, at a company, that person's not there. Nobody knows that Blue Frost decided three months ago that they're changing from a different A code to a K code or a E code to an A code, or that now you have to have certain documentation. So I think that's where some of the challenges, major challenges in my estimation, in my recent provider direct experience is those are some of the things that are continuing just because they're, they're, they're changing more rapidly. Right, than they may have in the past because the payers are trying to adjust to a couple of things, demands, cost, cost to them, product technology, right? That's something that we have thought about too much in our discussion that might influence our discussion today, but that is, is an outlier for sure. That's an area where I think through both the BPOs, with the tech companies that are specifically focused on MD, um, operational systems that are used to do intake and billing call, call the cash posting and so forth, there's still a big disconnect between how do I manage those payer changes such that I can uh, have my teams be effective, break thing flames, and not have these denials and things on the back end that would say, oh, why did you know that Brooke was supposed to change the policy or their coding and so forth and so forth and so forth. So that actually leads me to a, sort of a, a deeper question, right? Actually, I don't guess it is deeper. We were just talking about details. So if we back up a little bit, that's a lot of stuff for a back office to keep together. When we think of back office, Melissa, can you talk me through the sort of major, what are the major functional processes that make up a back office? Sure, yeah, sure. Good. And that, I think that'll segue into um, some of the things that I had prepped uh, as well to talk to today, depending on the organization, right? So there are some organizations choose to operate their businesses a little bit differently, but generally speaking, you know, what we see um, at the beginning point of the back office operation, or I should say the hub of the back office operation, regardless of whether it's in operations function or an RC, you know, front end or RCM function, is the confirmation process. We go through the whole coverage falsification, get the documents, you know, ship and deliver the product. And now we're at that point where can we bill it? What should we do now? Like, and have we met all the criteria? So, so confirmation means we're ready to, we're reviewing it to see it's already been delivered or right. we've already provided that service. Confirmation is a final QA yes. before yes. you release the yeah. claim. Exactly. Got it. Yes. Yep. And so at that point, that form in some organizations that may still remain what I would call an operations function or front end 
related function before it gets turned over to RCM. And many organizations and general best practices, that would be an RCM function because it is a two-way and it does give the RCM team an opportunity from the portable billing side to do their own QA to ensure that they're not going to end up with something that will bumps down the line to them without some visibility, right, to, to any corrections or education or system changes that might need to be made to prevent a potential deny. So from a, from a function standpoint, it, it may, and in many cases, includes uh, a starting point of, of the confirmation, the billing process, how to get the claims, most of that today is automated in claims, in both submissions. But there's still an element of, of monitoring and the exceptions and rejections and that in that process and making sure that the files actually do get to where they're supposed to be. And then, of course, the, the collections process, which is okay, what is the outflow of non-paid claims. And so that is another hub in and of itself. Let's, I'll come back to a little bit more detail so that's what you want to get to. Uh, and then, of course, there's the fast posting, right? So this is a main functional in the back office, there may be some other things that are managed within that, such as stuff the management, whether or not a, uh, an organization decides to, if there's a documentation denial, keep that within the RCM uh, process to resolve or punt it back to the front end teams can also be uh, an individual uh, business decision as well. So within the core, here's a, a, the, the bigger piece of this. The test posting was today is also very highly automated. There is some outflow of the manual post and the host of that's highly automated. You know, where the real beat of the, you know, collections and, you know, test flow, which is what everybody needs, is in that optimizing the collection process from the denying. Definitely. Just working the claims, you know, it's denied. What happened? Why did it happen? How do we fix this? And then how do we prevent it? Them happen from that. never happening again. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that I think is important uh, in that structure, um, I often think that I'm, I'm going to really keep this very simple because this isn't complicated. It's discipline. And it's discipline to manage it in a way that's, that makes sense. Functionally, it's, there's only a few components to it. And other than the dynamics of the payer or any uh, outlier things that curveballs that might be thrown at us from a payer that all of a sudden has a system set up and now we end up with things we didn't expect. I believe that, and this is not rocket science, this is not a, a novel concept from my development standpoint. In stratifying the art collections by pair of roots, the other one seems to work the best, right? So you're trying to specialize, but not always specialize. You allow for some cross training, but it's easier in larger organizations where there's you know, more depth and resources to do this. But stratifying the art collections by pair of roots. Um, and that really comes back to my uh, earlier comment about managing the payer change. So that helps stay on top of those things and, and get a, at least a folder, uh, earlier window into whether or not those uh, things are changing or have changed. And also using that stratification wherever possible at the front end. So if you can take an intake team and a resupply team and a document collection team and stratify those teams similarly by pair of roots, then you can collectively take those cross-functional pods, as I was called them, and really harness the value of the, okay, so if I have an intake team that's focused on a pair of group, and I have a doc collection team that's focused on a pair of group, and I have a, a collections team that's focused on a pair of group, can you pull those teams together? Yes. Then you harness a larger group of people with a very depth of knowledge and subject matter expertise that they can share in those any information, knowledge, notifications, and then control how that those changes might come into a tool from a pair when there are changes, right? When it's a operations manager that isn't connected to the RCM team per se. Who's responsible? Who's getting that an email notice for Blue Cross Bullets? I think that's we're changing something. When you build these sort of pods, right? The cross functional pods, I, I think that's really what but sets up uh, an organization for the greatest success to manage. The one thing that today is not, I say, well managed or effectively managed within any systems or any communication and can really wreak havoc with a provider 
is when there are changes made by a payer around coverage guidelines, you know, qualifications, things like that. I love the the working by payer group and establishing that sort of network under the network that has to help with the feedback loop. And <laughs> that's it. That's, and that's everything is feedback loop. Yeah. And those, if you were looking at my document, those are the two words that are sitting there that I I stopped short of saying that that is exactly what you can create. Now, it sounds very, but it really creates, it requires some management to support it and a communication cadence that has to be built on top of that as well. But it certainly can lead to better optimization of the changes or notifications that might become a fund payer. So if there was one thing that I would say to the industry at, at large is how do we fix this? How do we harness we have national payers who have this cascade of uh, Medicaid MCOs that are not all consistent. For example, up in Massachusetts, you know, when one of the Medicaid's has contracted out to some of these other, you know, payer groups or payer entities, who they have allowed to use their own uh, coverage qualifications. So, you know, have a, effectively a, a, a parent, a Medicaid beneficiary who has signed up to an MC that is not straight Medicaid, but it's an MCO. This MCO is using their guidelines, and yet 10 other patients that are getting their next resupplies are straight Medicaid, and then three more are on a different MCO. And really, I just saw it you know, first hand, some of the challenges with, of okay, which one allows which? And, and in most of the systems, there are places to house information, like in a price table or in a payer record or in a it is no collective database or tool to either display to a person if they put a little cloud button or an info button to say, here's your bad lungs for this cake, right? I saw teens tracks that went on for miles. So with, right. and I used the risk pledge because of volume and, and, and so forth about a group of 20 resupply agents on a team's chest. Well, we want to remember if Blue Cross allows us to send out three days early. We have all the systems and all the tools. And I think beyond that, the one thing I would say that I think is is easier to manage and could be better managed by every organization is their individual system, business process system, and leveraging their system capabilities, which I can go to any company. I've been to thousands, literally, and any one of them is not optimizing and leveraging all of the capabilities with the output or the uh, denial type things that happen. At the so back. that actually leads me to another question. So you just hit a nail on the head for me talking about processes. So let's say I, I am a, a home medical equipment provider. I'm at wit's end. Melissa, things aren't going right. Where do you even start? to fix something like that. And I know both you and I have extensive experience with operational workflow analysis. So I wanted to see if you had any hints, tips, tricks for the provider that's just, ah, uh, where do they start? Yeah, that's a great question, Rachel, because it can be a multitude of places. And I think too often they don't look at style. So you don't, you can't, it's that old, you can't see the forest for the trees. Yes. I've got tongue problems and I don't know which one to attack first. And this one is, it's a 20% problem affecting 80% of my cash flow. Or right. it's a people and a training issue. And so I think one of the things that, you know, and I probably still always back slapped for me. You think your business and, you know, at some point in the past, anyways, if you think you know your business, and maybe people do tend to oversimplify it. And I don't say that they look enough external, where can I get some help and some support to, for someone to look in objectively at my business and help an, an owner or a, a leader to say, you know, exactly that's where the was stuck. And ideally you're trying to look at, okay, so what's the thing that's, what is the biggest pain point of the business to death, right? Is it, if it's collections that we go and, and there's a cash flow problem, then we know what direction to drive to. Like, well, right. Some analysis around the one of your denial. And then immediately, we're not going to focus all our energy on the collections effort. We're going to take a bigger portion of energy and focus it on how to stop the boy. These things are happening. And then we figure out if we have the right resources or enough resources 
the fix was already ha- correct or address was already happened. But I do think that two things. One is that I don't think that organizations in general have a sense of the value of looking extra to their organizations to help them solve these problems. Mm-hmm. And I also think that there's a lot of opportunity within their systems to audit and say, okay, first of all, are we even effective really? And for some of the print, there's some of that support is available in support contracts at no cost to some of those organizations. They have yeah. access to people who support the software who can answer questions or there's knowledge bases or there's, there's video and for things that they can sometimes the easiest solutions uh, seem as far out of reach and don't need to be. And then looking at, and I think this, I think there's been a shift when I started my yo. It was new when I was like, oh yeah, this is great. Well, it's knowledge. And then I think there was a, a, it seemed to be a shift where, well, if they do it, then they don't. Let me do it, then they don't. But I think today, clearly, in order to build capacity within existing hotels and offset costs, there are opportunities. And I don't think there's enough positive, I don't want to say press around mm-hmm. the value. I think there could be more positive press around the value of the BPO in terms of cost savings, scalability, technology, right? This is not just processing. Most of us included are not just intending to be processing entities, but partnerships and technology partners to do that. Say, offer some cost savings, uh, allow some scalability, and additional technology that partners with any existing or coordinates with any existing software platforms and technology that are in existence. You said something interesting about people not being willing to look externally. And in my experience, what I've found, Melissa, is a lot of people, when they look externally, sometimes things don't change. And that sort of dissuades everybody from why would I call in a consultant or a coach or somebody externally to come and fix my internal problem. And one of the things that I've found over and over is it's never bad. It's usually not bad advice, but there are is a lot of resistance to change. And then there's lack of accountability. So we might go in, Melissa, and say, this is what you need to do. And we work with the owner on it. Unless there's that follow-up accountability, it's still not going to happen, which you can also outsource. You can also, you can get, have a a coach and a project manager to come help you make it through your goals. Yep. I I think you're fluffy to all that. And I also think that the very first thing that somebody thinks about when they think it's a way to use the word consulting is the first thing that's expensive, right? Yes. And so I think the ROI um, components and trying to offset that objection is important. And mm-hmm. to your point, I can tell you that I had a direct, absolute direct experience with what you just described about when I was in a consulting role. I often would try to put the customer things with suggesting to them that, look, this is all I, it may look simple and, and I'm not trying to oversimplify it because I would tell them that from an empathetic standpoint, I, and this is all I do. I would say to them, oh, this is all I do. So it's easy for me to come in and say, oh, sure. You could do this. You could do that. You could change that, change that. Because that's all I did. But I would absolutely readily acknowledge to them, I understand, because going back to my very first statement or, or about my bio, I've been on both sides of this fence. I, I've been the customer who was having those issues. I was, I've been the person who probably should have used a consultant and didn't. And so I try to really put myself in, or to, did put myself in their shoes about, okay, I don't want to be this person who just comes in and says, oh, I'm doing this, 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 and this, and then I'm going to leave. And then. And everybody's going to be frustrated at the end of the day because they spent all this money, we gave this report, and, and then say, oh, yeah, well, that's great, but we don't have time. And I would get in their shoes about, I realize that this is all I do, but I realize it's not all you do. And that you have to now run your business and take this project or recommendations home as now another whole well, where am I going to find the time yes. and the resources to take all those things that you, so what I, tried to do was to break it down into, okay, here's the first few things Pieces. you can do that take this limited amount of time that will give you the most, give you a certain amount of time to give you a jump start, right? And so like, you want to like, try to think of an analogy that I could use, but so it could feel like, oh, that wasn't, uh, look, that was a simple thing we could do. And so try to prioritize 
And I go back to the system setup. Easy to find things that if you just turn on this flag to change, this is going to give you this exponential benefit. Then we can go down into the, okay, now we need to change the process, some workflow. And in my case, try to build a value for how we to continue to support them and that ROI, right? So that they will not just go back and look at it somewhat. This was expensive. And frankly, not to get too long-winded about this, but this is exactly how I ended up at my last employment was I went to the client several times. And at the end of the, th about the third time I said, don't call, don't call me. And, I, and I've been there. <laughs> I'm saying it a little bit more dramatically than I said at the time, but I said, you don't spend any more money because when I come here and I- You're not ready. Nations, yeah. And my employer who was supplying me as if it was all probably capital then I said that, but I, no, I think at the end of the day, they got, this is the kind of value you provide to apply it and say, and this is what BPO, bringing this back to not about me, but about the value of any BPO service, whether it's just the back box processing for layering in some consulting opportunities is, I said to this gentleman, I was saying, I've come here three times, we talked, we provided, provided, provided some guidance on, there's no one to hand this baton. So it doesn't make sense for you to keep doing this if you can't. If there is no one, and it wasn't a criticism, if there's just no one to take this baton, but it's time, expertise, interest, really cares. In your best interest, I said, I just don't think. And he's, and that's why I said, I know I need someone like that. And that's going to kind of like, you like me and like see who's working that. Yeah, there you go. You got the baton. But yeah. when I, my, to my, to end that statement a little bit, then here I am now, I'm on the other side of this saying, Oh yeah, all those things that I just told them that they needed to do, now I own them. Because now I am that person who now has the baton and now I have to run the business every day. And I have to take these things that, that I told myself that <laughs> we needed to do. And so I think that it just really brings us back to the beginning about perspective and what, what a provider, how difficult it is to manage a business and all these things. And why the value of offload some of the stuff offload. Mm -hmm. So I think getting back to the positive press, how do we position the continue to position the BPO services in a way that helps develop that ideal RCM, whether it's some of what they do internally, partner with what some of what we do for them and put it in some context that makes it digestible and consumable and then has some results oriented. Wow. No, nope, that's perfect. And I, perfect. Go ahead, Chuck. I, I was just going to say, wow, that is like so much useful information. And I know we're at time here, yeah. but yeah. I definitely want to have you back on and discuss some of these processes in more detail. Is there any final thoughts, any, any key takeaways that we haven't had a chance to get to yet that you want to make sure that our, our listeners get before we move on? No, but I want to say, I really want to talk about with Melissa logging, data logging, indexing, and getting rid of paper. Mm. I think we could talk about that, Melissa, for hours. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I wish you could see my notes here because literally it's, this is a really, it just means that they're all doing on the same page. But one of the things was just that. So I had some brain notes here about some of that using box, right, to log CMN. Is it automating the practicing? To the mm -hmm. extent that's still what's done, right? Even with some of the electronic means that happen to things. So yeah, I have a lot more here too. I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit of a high level, but um, certainly have some, and already put together some content around getting a little bit more granular. Well, to some of cool. Yeah, that's wonderful. And maybe we'll make this a whole series about creating the dream back office process. But that is super cool. And again, Melissa, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us today and sharing this incredible, unique, I think, expertise that, you know, there are very few people in the world who have. She's a unicorn. Of, exactly. <laughs> like the, I was just trying to think about how many people in the world have had this kind of specific experience and it's it's probably just melissa so but before we go let's let's tell the folks how they can find you follow you if they have a question for you how would you like them to reach out i would say for now a relatively new to this organization i guess um you know like emails my capability i probably want to uh, update some of the information but so, you know mm -hmm. through uh through my direct email very approaching okay 
And that is Melissa Wagner at Perchant.com. Yes. Melissa M. Oh, is it Melissa oh, Wagner? Oh, sorry. No, we're pouring. Uh, <laughs> let me double check that really quick. <laughs> Melissa W at Prochant.com. That's, okay. That's weird because mine is Chuck Ellis at Prochant.com. And well, I'm getting get ready Chuck to e ask at Prochant.com, which I'm glad I'm I didn't. getting ready to, <laughs> but I'm getting ready to have my, I'm getting ready to have a new existence as Rachel schools at Prochant.com. So nice. it's coming <laughs> as opposed to Rachel's at Prochant.com. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to really nuke it, Chuck, and start over. Love it. Yeah. All right. Again, thank you, Melissa, for joining us. Thank you for listening. Uh, please be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts. That will really help share this podcast organically and get more people to see it. You can also watch back issues of our episode over at Prochan.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Until next time, I am Chuck Ellis, and that there is Rachel Schools. And on behalf of ourselves and ProChain and the Modern Healthcare Back Office, we thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Modern Healthcare Back Office, a presentation of ProChant, a wholly owned revenue cycle management service dedicated to serving HME, pharmacy infusion, and other healthcare providers. Learn more about us at ProChant.com.